Hi, and as always, thanks for joining me. What we're going to look at now, very briefly, is Harold Wilson's involvement in Northern Ireland up to the period of 1970 and the start of what is commonly known as the Troubles. This is a very short introduction. Essentially, this is just the start of the Troubles and it will carry on in greater detail. Much more will happen as we move on through time, particularly as we get to 1980s and 1990s. However, before we go any further, we really need to understand the creation of Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland, two separate nations, okay, on the same piece of land off the coast of Great Britain. And Northern Ireland was created as a result of the Irish War of Independence in 1922. You had the six counties in the north of Ireland who would remain part of the United Kingdom and the 26 counties in the south of Ireland would form the Republic of Ireland. Now the majority of people in the north of Ireland were Protestant and the majority of people in the Republic of Ireland were Catholic and that will be an underlying theme that carries on throughout that time as you are looking at the Troubles. And this phrase that is used to describe the trouble and the conflict that occurs based on lines of religion quite often is known as sectarianism. So we have the north of Ireland or Northern Ireland with its six counties and then we have Republic of Ireland with its 26 counties and they're two separate countries. Now this whole period, this whole event brings with it its own vocabulary, its own language almost, which you need to understand. You need to get your head around very quickly so that then you can understand what happens as we move on. And to help you, I'll talk you through some of that now. Now, the first thing to understand is we've got two sides here. We've got what we would describe as the nationalists and unionists. So if we look at nationalists first, the nationalists support the idea of a united island. The best way I can explain it is one nation. So you're a nationalist. And it means Northern Ireland joining with the Republic of Ireland as part of the Republic of Ireland. They're Republicans. They don't agree with the legitimacy of British institutions such as the government in Westminster and the police in Northern Ireland. They don't support those ideas. And many of those people, as I said earlier on, in the north of Ireland, Northern Ireland, it's Catholics who want to see this happen. OK, so they're mainly Catholic organisations. And then we have what are known as paramilitary groups. So they're not military, but they're based on military lines. And the predominant one for this group, for the nationalists, is the Irish Republican Army. Now, they will be described as a terrorist organisation by the British government. Some Catholics will describe them as freedom fighters. They would describe themselves as an army seeking the liberation of the Northern Ireland to become part of the Republic. You'll see them described as the Irish Republican Army and sometimes also the provisional IRA, PIRA. Essentially the same organisation as far as you're concerned when you're doing your reading here. So that's one half. We then need to look at the opposite side. So if we've got the nationalists on one side, we've got what are known as the unionists on the other. They support the union of the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland. They want to see the north of Ireland remaining part of the United Kingdom. They're also described as loyalists by these people. They are loyal to the British government they are loyal to the British Crown. They see the value or see a value in British organisations and want to respect those organisations. They're predominantly Protestant, where we saw that the Republicans were mainly Catholic. The Loyalists are predominantly Protestant. And similarly, as the Irish Republican Army was a paramilitary organisation on one side, here we've also got paramilitary organisations as well. And an example of that group would be the Ulster Volunteer Force, the UVF. 
So that's how it breaks down. I haven't covered all of the paramilitary organisations. There are other splinter groups, there are other organisations on both sides, but I've given you an idea that each side has paramilitary organisations. Now, Northern Ireland has its own parliament, and that's Stormont, based in Belfast, or based very close to Belfast, is the Stormont government. And then you've got Westminster, which is governing the rest of the country. Stormont has a lot of provision and say over how Northern Ireland is governed. It's devolved powers across to the Stormont government. So with the Stormont government in mind, we now need to look at what that situation is like in the 1950s and 1960s in Northern Ireland. And what you see is that the Protestant community really do have the main say in how Northern Ireland is run. 90% of members of the police force in Northern Ireland at the time known as the Royal Ulster Constabulary are Protestant. There is a part-time, a volunteer organisation which supports the police and they're known as the B Specials and 100% of them are Protestants. 90% of the civil service, that organisation which supports how our government operates, is Protestant. Also within Northern Ireland, only ratepayers could vote. So this favours Protestants, because quite often within Catholic families, you find a large number of people living within the same household. So you only have one ratepayer. And that means within Catholic households, not as many adults have the ability to vote. You have to be a ratepayer to vote. And good housing is disproportionately given to Protestants. And it results in this ill feeling with unemployment being higher in the Catholic community as well. This disparity really creates an ill feeling between the two communities. And this is really well described in the extract that I'll show you now from Dominic Sandbrook's book, White Heat. And it is an anonymous teenager growing up in Northern Ireland. And he says here, two things that came across very clearly were, one, the almost apartheid nature of society, the people, Protestant and Catholic, left side by side literally, there was no contact between them. Secondly, he learnt very quickly from the other children at school that Catholics couldn't get jobs in a whole range of occupations. There was no point in applying for jobs on the local authorities or within the Northern Irish Civil Service, for example, nor in a whole lot of private employment the shipyard and the aircraft factory and so forth. That was just inherited folklore to all the children around. They didn't bother applying for these jobs. They were just close to them. So that's a really good description of life in Northern Ireland at that point. Really clear evidence of what we would describe pretty much as segregation. So if you've looked at 1920s America when you've been studying your GCSE, you could almost draw parallels here in the way that the Catholic community feel they are being treated. And in that very similar way of those parallels between the civil rights movement in America, you see the growth of a civil rights movement within Northern Ireland. And you see the Northern Ireland Civil Rights Association being formed. And they start raising the profile of these issues, conducting marches, demanding that change takes place. Peaceful marches and protests are organised and it's in an effort to raise awareness. But riots and violence invariably followed many if not all of these marches. And in a counter to the marches of the Civil Rights Association, you see what is known as the Loyalist Apprentice Boys, marching in support of Northern Ireland and remaining part of the Union of Great Britain and Northern Ireland. This organisation, the Apprentice Boys. It's easy to perceive that what you are seeing is a group of 16, 17 and 18 year olds who are apprentices marching in the street. It is an organisation named after the apprentices who closed the gates of Derry um, back um, in history, not current apprentices. The rioting then begins to escalate. So we see rioting escalate between Catholic protesters 
and the Royals to Constabulary. And this builds and builds and builds until August 1969, what is known as the Battle of the Bogside in a city called Londonderry or Derry. And there's a really good example of how this divide can affect even the naming of a town or city. If you're a Protestant, if you support the Union, you call it Londonderry. If you don't support the Union, you call it Derry. So even the naming of places could be divisive. So Londonderry or Derry, you see the Battle of the Bogside. And the B Specials are involved at this point and they're going very heavy handed. This is seen on the world's media and the images are terrible. As a result of this, in August 1969, with what is seen as a breakdown of law and order in large parts of Northern Ireland due to the rioting, Harold Wilson makes the decision to deploy the army, to send the army into Northern Ireland onto the streets with weapons to keep law and order. This is a momentous decision. And that essentially is the start of the troubles from where we're now looking at it. The civil rights movement, a breakdown in law and order, and then in August 1969, Harold Wilson making the decision to deploy soldiers onto the streets of Northern Ireland. It's worth looking at Dominic Sandbrook again at this point, and he has a really useful description of the Battle of the Bogside, which gives you an understanding as to why Wilson's made that decision. And it's an account again of an anonymous teenager. I was throwing stones, petrol bombs, bottles, everything. You know me, I remember having a serious hatred for the RUC at the time, and just wanting to sort of take revenge, because you saw people getting battered and choked with CS gas. I was on the top of Roswell Flats with a full view of everything that was going on. There were hundreds of people below and you had a perfect view. On top of the flats was a thing constructed by the Bogside people at the time. It was like a huge catapult. We could put petrol bombs on it and shoot petrol right onto the spot where the RUC were actually congregating. It was a powerful feeling, like you were fighting an armed force. That was my first conflict with the RUC. And this idea of a catapult, almost some Roman siege weapon, medieval times, firing petrol bombs onto the police. It's a really clear evidence of why Harold Wilson makes the decision to send troops into Northern Ireland. But that's the start of the troubles. That's the key thing we need to take away at this point. Harold Wilson of Northern Ireland, August 1969, has deployed troops onto the streets following the Battle of Bogside. Okay, thanks very much. Bye-bye.